Hi everybody, I'm Ian Cunningham from Vets of GB. Welcome to this episode of Engineering the Jigsaw, episode at foundation level number 12, why should we avoid an undesirable jigsaw? So in this episode, we're going to look at something new for engineering the jigsaw. Why do engineers need to make sure that vehicle EE systems don't present undesirable behavior to vehicle occupants and other road users? And we'll consider some of the things that they need to do to ensure this as well. When we're going through this episode, we're going to make use of some terminology that we've already introduced in other Engineering the Jigsaw episodes. So highly recommend that you watch our other episodes or have watched our other episodes before you watch this one, because otherwise we may use some terms you may not know. Before we go too far though, let's have some context. Each year, around 1.3 million people die globally in road traffic crashes. That equates to a death every 24 seconds. Given that a typical Engineering the Jigsaw episode is about 15 minutes long, that means that nearly 40 people, it's, a, it's about 37, 38, will die during the time it takes you to watch a single episode. That means that road traffic is the eighth largest cause of death worldwide. And in fact, it is the number one killer for people aged five to 29. You're more likely to die on the road in that age group than from anything else. And just over half of the deaths in road traffic are pedestrians, cyclists, or motorcyclists. So if you're riding around inside a vehicle, um, you're at risk as well, but you're even more at risk if you're outside a vehicle or on a motorbike. And it's estimated that in addition to the death toll, there are up to 50 million people injured on the road as well, every single year. That's roughly three a second. So again, in the context of an engineering the jigsaw episode, that is nearly, nearly 1,500 people in the space of one engineering the jigsaw episode get injured on top of the 40 that will sustain fatal injuries and die. And every single one of these deaths and injuries is preventable. We've got the quote here from Michael Bloomberg, who is the World Health Organization or WHO, Global Ambassador for Non-Communicable non Diseases and Injuries. And as it happens, the period 2021 to 2030 has been designated the WHO Decade of Action for Road Safety. All the statistics you can see here or I've just gone through with you, are taken from a WHO report, the Global Status Report on Road Traffic Safety from 2018, which you, you'll be able to find if you, if you search on the internet. So with this as context, let's think about what vehicles can do. Well, firstly, in, in terms of undesirable behaviour, a vehicle might do something that's just simply annoying or inconvenient, such as making an annoying noise or needing a button to be pressed multiple times before something works. It could also give warnings or indications for non-existent problems. So a load of warnings go off, you stop the vehicle, you get out, no problem at all. Really annoying. And of course, a vehicle might actually brake during normal use, it, it, you know, without any kind of expectation that it should brake in that situation. So, for example, a wire to a sensor or actuator might brake. And this, of course, will mean that something will no longer work in the vehicle. A sensor or actuator itself might develop an internal fault. And an ECU or an HCP as well might develop an internal fault. So this means that in some way the vehicle's broken, it's no longer doing necessarily what we want it to do. And what we then try to do is fix it. And this brings us to our next kind of undesirable behavior. So a vehicle may be unable to be fixed if a problem occurs. So for example, if we can't actually work out what the fault is, so what's the cause of the problems? If we can't diagnose it, we can't fix it. Maybe even more frustratingly, we may sometimes be able to work out what the problem is, but we're not actually able to fix it. So somehow whatever it is that's faulty can't be replaced. So clearly also a un un very undesirable situation. Moving on though, even more undesirable, bringing us back to our context of course, is the fact that a vehicle might do something that could injure or even kill somebody. 
So for example, it, the motor might try to move the vehicle when it should be stopped or vice versa. The brakes might not operate it when needed or they might um, operate when they aren't needed. The same might apply to the steering. So if you've got some kind of power steering system, it might try to steer you out of, out of your lane suddenly and, and make you crash your vehicle. Um, or alternatively, you, you might try to steer and, and it fights you not letting you steer. You know, that, that would be really bad. Um, clearly for, for you and probably also other people around you on, on the road. And beyond just the vehicle, of course, somebody or, or people might cause a vehicle to reveal data that's intended to be kept secret. So an example of this would be someone getting access to a user ID and a password that you use to download apps or maybe payment details that you use for automatic billing. So if you, if you have a a toll bridge or a toll road that you use regularly, you might set up your vehicle in some way to automatically pay your toll. If someone gets your payment details, they can take all your money. That's bad. Um, and of course, somebody might be able to cause a vehicle to present any of the undesirable behavior that we've already talked about, whether it's to occupants or other road users via some kind of hacking or attack. And this might be remotely or it may not be, it, it could, it, yeah. So especially obviously with connected vehicles, this is more of, of a risk, but you can still do things inside the vehicle. We'll talk about some of those things in a second. So let's start with safety. When we consider safety, it's quite usual to think about the level of risk presented by a system to a person that may be affected by its behavior. So road vehicle occupants, such as drivers and passengers, people around the vehicle, such as pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists, other drivers in other vehicles, and, and so on. People in workshops, also people maybe building factories, uh, building cars in, on, and trucks and buses in factories, they could also be affected by the behavior of the system. And we should evaluate then whether that level of risk is reasonable or not. And for a vehicle EE system in particular, we should consider whether the, the level of risk posed by it remains acceptable, of course, when it's being used correctly and operating in a normal fashion, but also if someone misuses it in a reasonably foreseeable way. So if we can foresee that somebody might maybe tape down a, a switch to keep it in a certain position, we, we should account for that in our design activities. And of course, we should also make sure that the level of risk posed by an electrical system remains acceptable when a failure occurs. So when a sensor fails, an actuator fails, an ECU develops an internal fault, we should make sure that the vehicle EE system remains as, uh, or poses as low a risk as possible to the occupants and, and other people associated in the environment of that vehicle. And the first two cases that we've got here, so the normal correct use and also misuse are addressed through ensuring safety of the intended functionality or SOTIF for short. And the last case we have here is addressed through ensuring functional safety. There are other risks related to vehicle EE systems, of course. And as vehicles become more connected, as I've mentioned, there is a chance of some kind of attack being carried out on them remotely. But we shouldn't overlook the possibility for local attacks. So if somebody who's cleaning our car or parking our car can steal our payment details, that's just as bad as somebody doing it remotely. Our payment details have still been stolen and we may not know. Now, this is, yeah, you may think this is all a bit extreme and a bit science fiction, but a real remote attack on a vehicle was demonstrated in 2015 by Charlie Miller and Chris Velasek. So this is not science fiction. It's nearly 2022 as I film this episode. So it, this kind of thing has been possible now for nearly seven years. Minimizing the ability of people to perform attacks or trying to at least minimize the effect of attacks is addressed through cybersecurity. Without adequate cybersecurity, an attacker might be able to either or both gain access to secret information, including things like payment data that might be held within a vehicle, or even to take control of the vehicle. And whether they mean to or not, this could cause the injury or death of 
people in the vehicle or other road users. What this means is that if we have no cybersecurity, there can be no safety. So there is no safety without cybersecurity. The two are, are, go hand in hand. As a summary, each year, many, many millions of people are injured globally or even killed by road traffic. And undesirable behaviour of vehicle EE systems is a possible cause of that harm. Vehicle EE system safety is improved during normal operation and during misuse through considering SOTIF. And it is also improved when faults occur through considering functional safety. A vehicle EE system may also be made unsafe or possibly reveal secrets via cyber attacks. And of course, these are mitigated and managed through considering cybersecurity aspects during the design. There's a load of more information on these topics on safety and cybersecurity in vehicles. So ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, has published many, many standards in relation to these topics. And I've got a short selection, just a selection of them here. So there's ISO 21448, which is for road vehicle safety, the intended functionality. That is due to be published as a, released as a final standard in, in March, but there's a, a final draft available right now. ISO 26262, which comes in 12 parts, covers the functional safety for road vehicles. ISO 21434 covers cybersecurity engineering for road vehicles. And there's ISO TR 4804, which covers safety and cybersecurity for automated driving systems during design, verification, and validation for road vehicles. So there's four. These are probably the four most well-known standards, but as I've mentioned, there are others, and also there are standards published by other standardization bodies as well that you may wish to go and look at. If you go to the Vector website, you can find details of our solutions for trying to ensure vehicle EE system safety and cybersecurity. So we have three parts to this, our solutions. We have consulting, so we can consult and help you introduce processes to ensure good safety or as, as good as possible safety and cybersecurity. We also have training on the content of the standards and the processes you need to have to meet them. And also, of course, we have products. So we have features in our embedded software and in our design tools that allow you to think about and implement safety and security features. We also have the ability to do testing of safety and security features in, in vehicle EE systems. So look at those. We have a huge, huge amount of webinars and articles on topics related to safety and security, particularly vector consulting. There's many webinars that they've um, provided on these topics. If you want to know more on these topics, please look out for those. That is everything we've got time for today in this episode. Thank you to everybody who's emailed us already and asked us for more information on security and safety topics in, in recent uh, in recent times. We really appreciate the, the requests. If you have an idea for an episode, if you want to know more, if you want to know more about something in this episode, please send us your ideas, your questions to our special email address, engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. Alternatively, of course, please place a comment wherever you found this video. See you again soon for another episode. I'm Ian Cunningham from Vector GB. Bye.